Well, hello, everybody, and uh, welcome to another edition of Coffee with Kalefi. Happy Thursday to you. Hope you're doing well. Uh, today, I'm joined uh, by my colleague, Bob Hot Rod Roar, and today we're going to talk about kind of one of the more often overlooked topics of uh, hydronic systems, and, and that's just cleaning it up first before you, you put it into service. And uh, I think we got a great topic here, but before we do that, let's go through some of the housekeeping slides. All right, so if you're having any issues with audio, uh, you know, a lot of times if you log out and log back in again, if you're really having some issues, you've got some technical technical support numbers there uh, that you can call into. Just remember that's not our technical support, that's the tech support for GoToWebinar. Uh, if you are looking for a copy of today's presentation, just make sure to check the box for yes uh, at the webinar survey at the end when everything's all said and done. And if you uh, have to jump off, you, you know, you got a, a hot job you gotta get to or whatever, uh, don't hesitate to do that. We always have these available online on YouTube and an archive. Uh, so you can usually view those a few days after uh, we record. All right, and then at the end of uh, today's presentation, uh, we are going to send you out a certificate of attendance. So if you can use that for any professional development hours within your jurisdiction, that would be great. And that'll come to you via email. All right, and then don't forget about hydronics. Our most current issue, uh, number 27, is about air-to-water heat pump systems and hydronics. And uh, issue 28 is going to be coming around the corner here pretty soon. Um, it's going to be on basically uh, commercial hydronic chilled water systems, cooling type systems using hydronics. Uh, pretty unique uh, little uh, addition. I think you guys will like it, especially if you're into the more commercial projects. And also, too, uh, don't forget, you know, we always offer those hydronics journals in paper. We offer them in PDF, but now we're offering them digitally. So not only are you getting all the information from hydronics, uh, but we're linking to other things within the digital versions that we are now available, making available on our website. Uh, so don't forget to check those out as well. All right. And then... We got to toot our own horn here a little bit, okay? Uh, obviously, AHR did not happen this year, and we're very sad uh, that we don't get to see all your smiling faces. Uh, but uh, we did actually get a winning entry in the Innovation Awards here with our Angle Mix. So if you're looking for a really cool thermostatic mixing valve for hydronic or plumbing applications, uh, look no further. You've got your hot inlet and your mixed outlet right in line with one another. It makes your piping really simple, really easy. Uh, really sweet thermostatic mixing valve. All righty, and then next month, uh, we are going to have David on from Burmad uh, talking about uh, basically pressure control and, and regulation of, of water in commercial type plumbing systems. Um, basically, it's going to be a great webinar. Uh, he's an application engineer at Burmad. And like I said, you know, we're going to talk about uh, just some of the water pressure distribution and, and things like that uh, to, to get you more, uh, more in tune with that topic. All righty. Now I'm going to turn things over to Bob and we'll be uh, going back and forth here a little bit. So Bob, take it away. Yeah, thanks for that nice intro, Cody. And yeah, so we're going to tag team a little on this. We thought that'd be a little bit more interesting for us, it is for sure, and hopefully for you. So uh, we'll be going handing it off back and forth. And Max, my son's going to be watching questions and he's welcome to interrupt us if there's a question, uh, you know, while we're on the slide that makes it a little bit easier sometimes and then going back and finding that. So also, um, I don't, Cody, I'm, am I on the screen? I think I am. I've got my camera. You are. You are. Yeah, so if that's taking up too much of your screen, folks, you know, you can slide me turn me off or slide me off to the side if it's taking up too much real estate on your screen. But we thought we'd uh, try and make it a little bit more personal by showing you me and my shop and, and what goes on where I'm at. So also I wanna say thanks to everybody for showing up, but also thanks for your support over the years, for Cleffy support, for the pictures that you send us of jobs and the, the questions, the hard questions you ask sometimes. Uh, we all grow and learn by that. And um, I know some of my colleagues, I think from Italy are tuned in today, so big, Thanks to them for keeping the pipeline full. We're one of the few companies, I think, that uh, have inventory. We've got stuff going out the door, so uh, that's good to know if you need a product. We are, we're in pretty good shape that way, too, and hopefully Italy can keep cranking it out um, through all these crazy times that we're going through. So, all right. Make a long story long. Let's get right into it. So, we're starting out with a poll question. Maybe this is an easier way to do it than... Uh, spreading throughout the presentation. So um, that's what we have, Cody. 
Yep, yeah, yeah, I'll take it away from there, Bob, uh, since you can't see it. So we just wanted to ask, you know, what you guys are using. If you are uh, an engineering firm, uh, what kind of programs you're using or specification services that you use uh, to develop your specs? Uh, so if you're not on the engineering side, you know, you can always click the I don't use specification services. Uh, but we're curious if you're using things like master spec or if you're just getting your own uh, specs and building your own library. Uh, we're just curious about that because it's something that uh, that we find useful. And, uh, and if it's something that, uh, you know, we might take part in uh, further down the road. But it looks like uh, the large majority uh, don't use specification services, but uh, it's kind of a 50-50 tie between master spec and the manufacturer's website. So it looks like you're doing all your own legwork there with those uh, that one option. But uh, good to know that master spec is, seems to be the, the predominant winner for that kind of service. Yeah, thanks, everybody. Yeah. Um... All right, so I know this is a topic that we've covered a few times, I think, over the years, Cody, going back, what, 10 years now that we've been doing coffee with Kalepi, but it's really an important one. And what makes me want to uh, cue this one up from time to time is I, you know, I follow a lot of the social media sites, and I see this question coming up about I'm starting up my heating system for the first time this fall or wherever we might be, and uh, I got air problems, you know, I've got lockout problems. Got, most of the time, those problems can be traced to air in the system that hasn't properly been, uh, you know, <laughs> taken out of the system for whatever reason, you don't have the right device or you haven't purged it or something like that. And others uh, because of the dirt and uh, corrosion and stuff in the system from uh, maybe bad water or something like that. So um, if you've seen it before, hopefully you can learn something new from it. We did put some new slides in it, some new product and stuff that um, that are out there. So we try and freshen it up, but it is important enough that we want to keep going back to it. So <clears throat> one of the first questions that seems to come up and uh, certainly with uh, newbies in the industry is, okay, what kind of pressure um, should I have in my system? You know, what to, I don't know if people understand what the, the fill pressure I'm talking about in a system, what why you put that in there at a certain pressure. So basically, uh, the fill pressure that you put in your piping system is what lifts the water to the top of the building. So uh, if you drive up to a building for the first time and you notice a four story apartment building, whatever it might be, in your head, you could say, well, it's a 40 foot tall building. With that number, now you can figure out when you go into the mechanical room and you look at the gauge on the equipment there you can tell if you've got the, the proper pressure because we want to be able to fill we want the fill pressure to lift water like the little drawing there on the side to the top of the building so you can just do that uh, the height of that building times 0.5 just to do the math in your head pretty easily you know 20 psi obviously the correct number is 0.433 psi to lift water up a foot but again if you round it to 0.5 do the math in your head. So um, that would be the first thing I would look at when you walk into a mechanic room is, okay, find a gauge. Hopefully it's an accurate gauge. If not, have one in your toolbox or your truck with it that you can put a gauge on that you know and trust and then see what the pressure is. Because that can have a lot to do with air problems. If the system hasn't been pressurized properly, you could have a big air bubble at the top of this uh, loop or this building that's causing some of these uh, issues that you're having. So that's the first thing that you want to do is check that pressure, confirm that pressure. And in some cases, um, you can add a little bit of pressure to a system. If you've got a chronic air problem, sometimes just adding a couple PSI fill pressure can squeeze those bubbles smaller that are stuck up in high points and bring them back to them. So in addition to knowing the height of the building and coming up with that number, we like to see a positive five pounds pressure at the highest point in the building. So that might be a you know an air handler up in the ceiling, it might be a radiant manifold on an upper level. So a couple of reasons for that. Number one, we want to have a little positive pressure. So up on the top, oftentimes you'll find a little um auto vent like this. It might be up on an air handler, it might be up on a water heater that's up at the top level. So the way this works is that when there's air in here, this float's going to settle down and the air is going to come out through this little Schrader type of valve here until the water starts to rise up in there. And when the water gets up to about this level where the blue shading is, it's going to shut off this little um, needle valve in here and shut the device off. So if you've got a little bit of extra pressure, the five pounds of positive pressure, we're getting a little pressure helping you make that seal there in, in addition to just the buoyancy of the float in the water there. So it assures that we've got a nice tight seal on these little um, auto air vents. And the other thing I want to show in this uh, example here, notice in the drawing, I hope you can see it, it's a uh, blue shaded on the bottom and you see this white area. And that's a little air gap that we want to maintain in this air vent because what will happen, and I've done this myself, is you'll go up to an air vent and you'll take your finger, a, a screwdriver, the end of a pencil or something like that, and you'll stick it in there and you'll push this little stem down to confirm that you've got water up to this point in the vent. 
Well, what happens is when you do that, you you lose this air bubble, you pull it out, you pull it out until water comes up here, water sprays out and you say, oh, okay, I got water filled to this point, I'm good to go. We wanna maintain this air bubble because any dirt and debris, Teflon tape, whatever might've floated up with the water when it came into this air vent, being at the high spot in the system, we don't want that getting into that little needle valve right there. And that's why we try and maintain that little air gap. That stuff can float around down here out of harm's way, so to speak, uh, without getting into our valve. So as soon as you push that down, whatever might be floating and air comes in there and now you've got a dripping or a leaking air vent so if you do want to burp out an air vent sometimes you can just loosen it on the thread here and to see a water streaming out then you know obviously that you've got water up to that point uh, that high point in the building wherever this vent might be or if you've you've burped air out of a you know an air coil or something like that where that might be so uh, what else do I have there no, I think that's it so one of the things that you wanna do when you start purging the system is you wanna make sure that you've got enough water coming into the system to keep up with the purging hose that you're purging it out. So most of the time, if you have a fill valve on a system, you'll have a valve that'll have a fast fill function or feature on it. It might be a little hoop that you have to flip over. It might be a nut, a lock nut that you have to loosen and tighten down the thing to put uh, more tension on the spring here to raise the fill pressure. The nice thing about the Cleffy auto fill valves, these are fast fill valves. Right out of the box, this valve Whatever setting you set at the top, whether you put it on 10 pounds of pressure or 25 pounds of pressure, this valve is going to fill at about five and a half gallons a minute, all the way up to well, close to wherever it goes to the shutoff point. So if you've got it set at 15 PSI right here, turn the water on. As long as you have 30 PSI or more coming into this valve, it's going to fill at that five and a half gallons a minute. Now, the nice thing about that is if you know you want your system at 15 PSI, set it up here on that slot right there to 15, and you can walk away from it. You can go up to your radiators, to your baseboard, whatever it might be, and you can start bleeding it. You don't have to worry about running back and catching it before it goes up to 30 PSI, <laughs> popping your relief valve, and now you've got a mess in the mechanic room in addition to uh, uh, the air problem that you were trying to solve in the first place. So we call this a set it and forget it valve for that reason. Crank it up to whatever uh, pressure you want to fill that at, walk away. One other thing I want to point out about, you can see it on this little uh, uh, kind of cutaway view of it. <clears throat> this knob on the bottom is a shutoff. Now, a lot of people don't realize that actually on the bottom of it's stamped, there's a little arrow on it, it says open and close. But if you are of the opinion, and we're going to have a little debate about this coming up, if you're of the opinion uh, that this valve should be left off when you leave, you can actually turn this knob and you can see right in here, you can shut this valve off. So now you don't have to worry about if you shut a ball valve off next to it, that somebody comes down the next day and says, hey, somebody left that valve off and they open it up. You intended to leave the fill valve off and now it's back on. If you're of the opinion that can cause your problems down the road, this is maybe a stealth shut off Cody that we call it that you could shut Incognito, off. Incognito yeah yeah a little bit less conspicuous. Yeah and the other thing that we've added in the past couple of years is this pressure gauge. A couple of things about that number one it confirms that whatever you set up here on the knob on the dial up here is exactly what you're getting so if you want 15 pounds you set it at 15. Sometimes there can be a little bit of error on this if these have been taken apart on the job site and they don't get these gears back in the same place uh, you might have an error between what you think you're setting it at and what you're actually getting so we find this to be a little bit more um, trustworthy maybe than some of the ga uh, gauges that come with the boilers that are number one a very coarse scale so it's hard to get a you know a tight number between 12 and 15 so uh, the other thing about that it can be used for troubleshooting so let's say you fill up a system and you're going to go take a coffee break or go to lunch shut the valve off and if you come back and you left it at 15 and it's down to zero it tells you you got a leak somewhere in the system or air has been vented out of it so don't walk away if this gauge keeps dropping off when you shut it off so uh, we just thought that was a nice addition you can get it with or without the gauge if you buy it without the gauge it will still have this tapping on it right here so if you want to add a gauge later you just take out that little plug there and you could add or if you want to put a pressure transducer in there and tie, tie it into a building automation um, you've got that threaded connection there for that How'd I do on that, Cody? Let me get it oh, no, you're doing great, Bob. I, uh, I, you know, just one thing to add, you know, I know a lot of guys will like to pipe bypasses around the autofill valve. Really not necessary with this guy. Um, and, you know, you talk about the fast fill levers and buttons and stuff like that. Uh, one of the worst things, you know, if you're doing service on a boiler or whatever, and then all of a sudden you, you accidentally pop that PRV, the pressure relief on the boiler. If it's an existing boiler, I can guarantee you that pressure relief's not going to seal again, and uh, and you're replacing that too. Uh, so definitely, uh, you know, if you can avoid using those types of levers or a bypass and just use this instead, I think it's going to make your life a whole lot easier for sure. Yeah, that's an excellent point. I mean, it, most of the time when you pop a pressure relief valve to test it, uh, 
the same thing happens that I just showed you on that air vent. You'll get a little bit of debris in there that's been, you know, hiding yep. underneath. As soon as you pop it, you got that under your seat. And now you got a, a dripping relief valve. Now you got to replace that before you leave the job. So don't plug it. Replace or you it. can sell them a bucket too. I mean, it, whatever works. Yeah, so. there you go. <laughs> now, the other thing that has to happen when you charge a system for the first time or even on a troubleshooting call, replacement call, is you want to check the pre-charge in these expansion tanks. And that needs to be set at, the, or I'll give you a little tip here too, at the pressure that you're going to fill the system to. And uh, even on a, a troubleshooting job, I think I would isolate that tank. Maybe there's a valve on it or, you know, lower the pressure so you can check that air charge to make sure that it didn't lose some air. Because if that uh, diaphragm doesn't charge properly, you're not going to have enough expansion uh, space. So that needs to be charged. Now, there's one thing that I've been learning lately. I've read this in a couple different places and we've talked about, it, I think, I think he talked about on our last webinar, in fact, on chilled water systems. You can uh, consider, uh, I put it right here, uh, setting that pre-charge a pound or two below where you're going to fill it. And what that'll allow happen is a little bit of fluid will go into that tank. So especially if you're going to shut off your fill valve, now you've got a little bit of reservoir. If some air burps out of that system, you've got a little bit of fluid in there that will fill up the space where the air came out. So some people are, and I saw this on some of the social media sites recently, a guy saying, yeah, I'm going a, a two pound lower on my pre-charge and what I'm going to fill for. And on a chilled water system, you think about it, if you fill that system with, say, uh, 70 degree water, whatever your ambient temperature might be in that room, and you cool that water down and it contracts, your pressure is going to drop. So on that, uh, what could happen right down here on a chilled water system, if you pull that charge or that pressure down, you can actually have the diaphragm go up against a nipple in that tank and now you don't have an expansion device in there and you can actually uh, drop with your pump starts you can drop to a sub-atmospheric condition in there because you lost that so uh, I also saw this in the solar industry and I took a, a, a seminar years ago when we were doing a lot of solar I think it was a Wiesman seminar and they called that a safety seal on their solar thermal systems they always pumped a little bit more in the tank so they said you know as that temperature drops at night whatever it might drop down to you don't have your gauge going down to zero and you get a phone call you got to come over I got a leak in my solar well no you didn't the water uh, temperature dropped and your pressure dropped uh, because of that so uh, use that however you may and this is another thing this I built here in my shop this is where I just took an, a, an expansion tank and charged it uh, well you can see my lazy hand right there on this gauge I charged it up to 50 pounds of pressure right there just uh, on a hose or a pump if it's glycol put a pressure reducing valve on an auto fill valve there and now you can hook this up to your system and just leave it there for a day or a week or a month whatever so if any air does come out of the system this is going to fill it with fluid in behind it so you don't get a call back on that system that the pressure dropped off or one in the lockout or whatever. Super simple to make one of these. You know, this happens to be a horizontal mount tank. Uh, I think it's probably a well tank, but uh, any expansion vessel would be could be used for this. And uh, again, just a valve to fill it. I like to have a gauge on it. Number one, that gauge tells me when I fill it, how much pressure I put in there. And then I can see when the tank is empty, of course, by the gauge dropping off there. So that might uh, be a little trick you can use sometime if you don't have a fill system or if you don't have a fill tank on the system, you can just kind of home make one quickly and easily. All right, I'm a big fan of the hydronic cleaners on a brand new system. You know, there's all sorts of stuff that's going to be or could be in that system, oil, solder flux, paste, and stuff like that. There's probably a half a dozen manufacturers that make uh, soaps, detergents, basically, that you can put in with your system, run them for uh, maybe a day or two, let your system get up to temperature, make sure all the loops and zones are circulated. And uh, I don't know if that's what you did in this case here. This is your picture, Cody. I'll let you talk about what's in there, but yeah. it'll just kind of clean your system. Yeah, and, and this is actually a, a picture before any type of cleaners or any chemicals were added to the system. And you might notice uh, in the in the the barrel of that uh, that little tank there, we actually got some little uh, solder or excuse me flux boogers uh, just hanging off the the side over there. Uh, just through a normal flush, just getting the velocity up, um, it took out all kinds of flux. It took out thread tape, copper shavings, the whole nine yards. And then the cleaners are going to take that one step further and make sure it uh, it really gets itself cleaned out. Yeah. Now. Knowing that, you know, on some of these older systems, if you've got an old iron pipe system with cast iron radiators that have been in, I don't know if you can see it, I got a radiator right next to me that's 100 years old that I took out of a, a friend of mine, took out of a church job in Chicago and gave it to me. It's kind of a decorative radiator, but you're not going to get all the crap out of those radiators. I mean, I've shaken this thing, I've turned it upside down, I put my pressure washer on it. Every time I move that, rust comes out of the bottom of it. So that's a reason we'll talk about having a dirt separator that's going to work after you leave the job because you're not going to get everything out of those oil 
have um, systems that have a lot of debris that's been in there for 100 years, whatever it might be. So, but the cleaners can take that uh, an additional step. So, whenever I see, um, you know, a picture on social media, what people are running into, uh, I ask number one permission to use it. But you know, it's just, uh, I mean, it really happens out there. You can see on the left here, that's a Y strainer cartridge that somebody pulled out of a Y strainer. Well probably not going to get much flow through that. So if you've got a pump downstream of that, if you've got a boiler downstream of that, whatever the devices might be, you're not going to get adequate flow to that. And uh, <clears throat> that's why this type of device, you got to go back and service it. Even some of the separators out there can get gunked up with uh, whatever is in the fluid in this system here. You can see it's it's pretty much plugged up. This is an air vent, by the way, not a dirt separator, but um, probably not getting a lot of flow or a lot of air elimination with a device like that. So not, not the fault of the device by any means. It's just they're doing their jobs, kind of. On the left here they are. This is kind of doing a dual purpose, but you're going to need uh, a cleaner to get that out of that. That's probably not going to just, that's kind of an oily, uh, greasy feeling uh, build up in there and that's going to take a cleaner to get those rings back down to what they should look like to do their job of air removal so so what uh, what you want to do on a system when you're purging air out is have a lot of places that you can isolate the system especially on a, on a big system and, and break it down to little subsections because you're not going to take a system that has like an inch and a quarter inch and a half two inch piping whatever it might be and be able to purge that out with one single hose especially with the five and a half gallons a minute that's coming in through the autofill valve so by doing this and this is actually a tank that's sitting right next to me my solar uh, a 500 gallon solar storage tank and I just put an isolation valve with a, a purge port on every one of these connections into that tank. So there's a plate heat exchanger for my domestic water. Uh, that's coming from my wood boiler. This is going out to my radiant floor, mixed temperature. So um, I can isolate like two of these and open up the third one so I get good flow through that one uh, circuit and make sure I can uh, <clears throat> purge it out well. And also I can, uh, with these uh, Webstone brand valves, I don't know if you can see on the handle, you can swap the handle on this and you can purge it from either direction. So I can purge through the system this way first, which is where I have a check valve in this pump. Uh, I can flip that handle over and I can purge from the opposite direction. So if you have the ability to go both directions, sometimes that can help you get a purge quicker, get more dirt and debris out of it. And then I've got a port if I want to inject some uh, some cleaner in there. If I want to take a water sample, I could take I could put a gauge on this port right here. If I had a gauge with a you know a female hose connection on it, I could put a pressure gauge on these to see what's going on with my system pressure, what my uh, delta P from that circulator might be at. And so, there's a lot of brands of these out there. Different manufacturers make what we call purge ball valves. Um, this is one that we had in our solar stations. You can see it's got the isolation and uh, two ports on it. There, different connections that you can put on that. Anything else there, Cody? No, definitely take advantage of, of the valves that are out there these days. There's a lot of different and very unique valves that just, they make your job and your life so much easier. And uh, yeah, like you said, being able to purge, being able to add chemicals, um, you know, it, it just, yeah, it's, it's a no brainer in my opinion. Yeah, it's pretty hard to over valve a system. Obviously, there's some cost involved, and I know a ball valve, if you don't use it for 30 years, sometimes you come back to that and it doesn't always work the way you hoped it would. But um, the next guy that works on that system will appreciate that you put some isolation in there and some purge ports that if anybody has to break it down and work on it, um, they've got the ability to easily get that system uh, up and going. So. So we'll talk about these both a little bit because, again, these are probably the two most common problems that uh, that you're going to have in a system that's not performing properly. Uh, maybe it's not the efficiencies off on that system, and it's going to be related most time, assuming it was put together properly and everything was sized properly, the pumps, the you know the parts in the system were sized properly. Most of the um, the problems, the troubleshooting calls, are going to be related to one or both of these. So. And they're going to affect a couple things in your system. They're going to affect the performance of the system. Obviously, if you've got air bubbles in the pump. Uh, it's not going to circulate the water the way it should or not enough water under some cases. Uh, certainly, you can airlock a pump where it doesn't move any fluid at all. Then it can burn out. So the performance, the warranty. Um, I can talk about it here. I got a slide, I think, coming up later. But I sat in on a Bell & Gossett um, pump webinar here a couple months ago and they're actually saying that water quality is the second thing in addition to air water quality they're actually putting a water quality spec now on their pumps and stuff like that which uh, I didn't get permission to use that slide yet so I didn't put it in there but I'll, when I got a water quality slide coming up I'll talk a little bit about what specs are saying for um, uh, water in their 
in their pumps and stuff like that. And obviously the longevity, the efficiency of the equipment. If you've got a heat exchanger, let's say a boiler, and you've got flame against the metal of that boiler, and if you've got even little micro air bubbles stuck on the heat exchange surfaces, obviously you're not going to get the efficiency out of that boiler. Not all of that fire, so to speak, is getting to the water because you've got a layer of air in there. And the same would apply if you had a layer of um, a hard scale from, you know, your original fill water maybe had some high uh, scaling minerals in it that when you filled it, they coated out that heat exchanger. You're going to drop your efficiency right from the first day you put it in there. And I know some of the past uh, webinars we've done, we show cutaways of different types of boilers that had a buildup of uh, lime scale on them from the fill water that went into those for the very first time. So we can help you with all those things. We can help you with air removal. We can help you with micro bubble removal. And you can see over here with dirt removal, we've got a product um, from uh, three quarter inch all the way up to 14 inch that we can help you with these systems to make sure that, you know, you want to sell, uh, you want to install what the customer is expecting and what you sold them was a high efficiency, a long lasting, a performing system. And a lot of that uh, problem is traced to these two different things. And these, you know, I've got dozens of slides of different boilers that people have sent me that this is what they find when they cut open a system. So, um, some of the particles in there probably went in from uh, components when they manufactured it. A lot of this in here, I can tell by the color of the scale. Typically, if it's a white scale or a bluish scale to it, that's something that came in with the water. That's not uh, rust or corrosion. It's going to usually be a black or reddish color. But uh, if it's got scaling minerals in it, calcium, magnesium, uh, the typical hard water scaling minerals, it'll typically show up as these little white particles. So. Um, if you've got aggressive fluid in the system, uh, glycol, if it goes bad, the pH drops on it. That pH will uh, start, that low pH water can uh, start, or fluid can start attacking the, the soft metals in there, your brass and your copper like that. So some of the particles that you see in there might be the breaking down of the metals in the system. Um, usually, if you see a lot of rust and black colored water, it could be an indication that you're getting oxygen into that system because in order for corrosion to happen, we have to have oxygen there. So oxygen, a component of air, it can come into a system, uh, obviously, through non-barrier radiant tubing. It can come in around uh, pump seals, around stem packings, and a lot of different places oxygen can get into a system. So um, that can be a tricky one to keep out 100%, especially on an old system where you do have mechanical seals on your pumps or there's different stem packings on old uh, radiator valves or something like that. There's another way that you can deal with oxygen ingress and the uh, hydronic conditioner chemicals that you buy. One of the components in there is an oxygen scavenger. They put a component in there that will... Uh, Oh, kind of like when you put the alcohol and gasoline that has water in it, it kind of absorbs that water. That's what the scavengers can do is they can remove some of that oxygen. But as those get used up, you have to go back in a couple of years and maybe boost up those, um, those scavenger chemicals. So if you have a system where you can't get a handle on the oxygen getting in there, you can use a you know, an oxygen scavenger, you just got to keep uh, boosting. A lot of the outdoor wood furnaces, Cody, I know you've worked on those, that's a chemical that they'll put in there because they're open to the atmosphere, they're getting oxygen all the time, so they just keep beefing up the um, sulfides or whatever the chemical might be to scavenge the, um, the oxygen out there and limit the corrosion potential. Yeah, and if you are working with, you know, uh, a tubing that does not have an oxygen barrier, you know, the old rubber tubing and things like that, you know, um, your best bet is probably just to separate it from anything that is ferrous, you know, with a plate style, style heat exchanger, stainless pumps, things like that. And then then at least you're you're limiting your exposure to a potential boiler failure, um, you know, and, and material failure in general. So. Yeah, there were a few boiler manufacturers, and I'm assuming they're still out there, that won't warrant either product at all if it's connected to non-barrier tubing systems. I don't yep. know if have to come out and see that or know that, I guess. But if you send a boiler back, they, you know, the people that do this for a living can pretty much tell what's happened inside that boiler when they cut it open or they, they look inside there. They'll know, you know, based on the particle that's in there, uh, what the uh, cause of that was. There's people that do that for a living that are pretty uh, savvy that way. So, so we talked about a good flush cleaning. The other thing, know the quality of the fill fluid. I just did a little research, in fact, this morning, because I'm, when I get to that B&G slide, I'm going to talk about the hardness of water. 85% of the U.S., according to the website I went to this morning, has water that's considered hard. And by hard water, it's 7 to 10 grains, 7 to 10.5 grains per gallon or higher. Above that, it's considered very hard water. So there's not many boiler specs or indirect tank specs or something like that that will allow over seven grains per gallon hardness and maintain the warranty on that product. So what you can take away from that is if you're using job site fill water on your systems, it's probably not meeting the spec of the pump people, the boiler people, the heat exchanger people, 
uh, our components. We don't like to see hard water that can scale up anything that we have that has a, uh, a heat transfer, you know, component in it. So you gotta um, you gotta know that. You gotta test your water. You know, you can buy Amazon. You can buy a little hardness test kit for probably 25 bucks in a little dropper, dropper, dropper. Uh, TDS meters. If you want to know the total dissolved solids, a little bit more expensive. You can get a little pencil meter. I should have brought one here uh, that you can just stick in the water. It's just reading the conductivity of the water, and you can know those two critical numbers. Um, I would say the pH of the fluid is critical, the hardness of the water, and also the TDS are the three numbers that are going to tell you, yeah, I better do something with this water. I better fix this water before I put it in the system so and then you have to maintain that water if you're going to put chemicals in water you've got a chemical romance going on and you're going to go back there and you're going to keep doing it because the chemicals are going to get um, used up or consumed as they do their job in that system so it's not a one-stop uh, trip when you start putting these uh, chemicals to handle oxygen ingress or other problems with the system in fact we've got in process and I don't I didn't look at uh, everybody on the the list today, um, IAPMO has got a committee together. We're putting together a water quality standard, probably going to be a fluid quality standard, probably cover glycols, and we're hoping to have that done within a year. We've got, I think, 15 people on that committee from all over the industry, installers, chemical people, uh, water people. I think we've got a really good uh, team put together, and we hope to have a, it'll be an ANSI standard, which will show up in code books. It's going to take years probably for all the codes to adopt it, but it's going to give you some specific information on what you need to look for and what you need to do if you do have water that's out of spec. You know, it's one thing to say, okay, it's bad. Now what do I do? So uh, we can help you with that a little bit. We're not water experts, but we've learned a lot in the research of um, uh, of water quality. And also over in Italy, they do a lot with water quality. They do a lot of testing. They, um, they know quite a bit about that. So um, let us know if we can help you with that. You know, Bob, it's funny. Uh, I actually did a seminar back when I was still in the field doing service work, and and it was through one of the cleaning um, uh, chemical type companies, you know, that make inhibitors and and cleaners and stuff like that for hydronic systems. And and uh, what he said really resonates to this day is the fact that that water quality and cleaning of systems is the next frontier for these hydronic systems and their energy efficiency. I mean, you think about boilers. I mean, they're capable. These gas boilers are up to 98 or 99 percent efficiency i mean how much more are you going to get out of the combustion side you need to get it out of the water side now yeah yeah and that's exactly right it doesn't take much to when you've got a, a boiler some of these small residential boilers only hold a gallon of water and their metals are um like they had a sample a piece of metal here super thin i mean here's a cutaway of a little oh uh, this is called a, a water tube type of boiler geonomy munchkin lockover whatever you might be i mean the thickness of that wall is like cardboard not going to take a lot of abuse, not going to take a lot of scale before you get a hot point on that and that metal can burn through from the intensity of flame around it. So got to pay attention to that water quality. What I'm trying to show on this slide here is just um, what we have to help you with fill systems. I talked about this little, our basic half inch auto flow, uh, auto fill here. We also have a three quarter version of that that'll go up to about nine gallons per minute. And then of course, if you need a lot of flow, we've got a um, fill and purge card here. It's got a half horsepower um, a little stainless steel pump on it, which is nice, so it doesn't rust, and that'll give you about 12 GPM, again, depending on the pressure you're asking it to pump to. So most of the time on small residential, light commercial systems, one of these three here is gonna be adequate. You're gonna get to a point where you're gonna have to call in the big guys if you need you know, 50, 60, 100 gallon per minute to flush out a, a four inch pipe or a six inch pipe. Probably not gonna do that with one of the valves or one of the uh, components I'm showing you on the slide, but there are people that can do that. Um, if you need help purging out a big uh, a geo loop field or something like that, where you need a lot of GPM to get the um, get all the the dirt and debris out of that system. So, yeah, we just talked about this a little bit. Everything that's in the system. I mean, even brand new copper pipe. If you were to uh, wad up some cotton and shove it down through that stick of three quarter copper pipe, when it came out the other end, it's going to have some grease and oils on it because that's how they draw that pipe. Is they use lubricants when they draw, call drawing lubricants to make that, and they don't always scrub all that out. So uh, you think you're getting brand new shiny clean pipe? In fact, there's probably some you know byproducts of the uh, manufacturing there that you want to clean out, and that's why it's important to use a uh, a cleaner, a detergent, or a soap, or something to break that down. Water doesn't always, as you know, get grease out of system very well, or oil, or pipe dope. Uh, that's why the chemicals can help uh, clean that out a little bit better and make sure that you've got everything in your system cleaned out. 
Well, you know what's funny, Bob, too? We, sorry to interrupt, but we actually had a great comment from Pete who said uh, he mentioned that contractors say that they don't need to clean copper piping systems since they use pro press fittings. And it's, I mean, you hit the nail on the head. I mean, granted, when you're soldering, there's a lot more chances for solder BBs and flux and all that fun stuff to, to get in there, copper pipe shavings or Copper pipe yeah. shavings are going to happen whether it's press or not, or or sweat. But yeah, you still have all the manufacturing uh, chemicals, the oils, and and not only that, just the stuff that lands in the pipe, whether it be mud wasps or you know uh, insects or birds or whatever. Uh, it's amazing the stuff that can end up on inside those systems. So well, and now that you brought that up, Cody, that's a good point because here's a pro press fitting, a brand new fitting, and if I put my finger in it, guess what's <laughs> yeah. on that o ring? Mm, yummy, yeah. Okay. yeah. If you're telling me that's a clean fitting and you don't have to clean it, whatever that lubrication or that grease is, that might be harmless as far as, you know, drinking it or something like that. Hopefully it's a, a non-toxic <laughs> grease, but there is something on that O-ring when they put it in there to make it slide together. So some of that I would assume is going to go in with the with the pipe when you put in that fitting. So uh, why not clean it out? You know, there's no harm in cleaning out your system. And the same thing when we make stuff in Italy, maybe Max can comment on what's going on in there. I think that's probably a measure device but you know we make um, we machine things from bar stock we do sand castings some of our products some of it's forged uh, where it goes through the you know the graphite coating when it gets forged and stuff like that we do the best to get all that off of it or out of it when we uh, put it in a box and send it out but there's going to be a little bit of residual um, <clears throat> you know products in that so any question Max I know I'm, I'm going kind of fast here but we got some time if there's anything that uh, that you want to Add or if there's any questions coming in, you can uh, open up your mic and we'll we'll certainly sure. address. So a couple of questions about uh, cleaners for recommendations for types of cleaners, and then um, another one as far as uh, draining or wasting the cleaning solution. How much do you need? Yeah, and so I would uh, send you the manufacturer, and I mean, I don't want to be a, a name dropper here. I mean, Romar is a big name out there. Uh, Fernox is another name. Sentinel is another name. Hercules makes a bunch of different cleaners, a utility brand. I mean, pretty much any company that makes chemicals for um, for putting plumbing stuff together, pipe dopes or solder flux or something like that, are going to have cleaners. What I do know, what I learned, uh, the Romar people are close to where I live here, and I've worked with them over the years developing some test labs and stuff for them is there are different types of cleaners and there are some that are soap detergent based and some that are acid based like uh, right behind me I've got a, a jar of Hercules sizzle and that's meant for if you've got hard water deposits like it's meant for water heaters it can be used for cleaning out drains too but it is actually a potable water approved uh, cleaner but it's an acid base so if you think you have residue in there that was from a lot of fill water entering and it has a lot of hardness in it I found that that works better the acid based chemicals or cleaners work better than the soaps to, uh, to break up that um, you know that hard water scale it's just like when you uh you know cody probably knows cleaning air conditioners and stuff like that when you spray that on the uh, coils and stuff like that it's uh it's going to clean them up a little bit quicker than the uh than the soap will to use an acid base so you know that's why i think it, the first thing you want to do is identify what's in your system you know is it just grease and oil from the manufacturing and chips from sawn or cutting or whatever it might be probably the next slide is going to show all that um that will come out pretty easily with a soap or detergent but again if it's got a lot of hard scaling i think the one a couple slides back where you saw those white deposits in there that was probably from the the hard water going in there and so yeah this is a right here in my shop this is exactly what I found in pipes in Missouri the one over here is a mud dauber and anything that has a hole in it my shop or outside my shop is going to have a mud dauber's nest in it almost guaranteed so yeah if you put that in the system without uh, knowing or checking that you might not get water through that but some of the things that you put in there you know at our factory in Milwaukee some of the products that we assemble we use Loctite uh, that's what assembles a, a straight thread, a VSP thread that doesn't have a taper will be Loctited together. So some of that's going to be inside it. We do clean them, but some of that will get through. And of course, all these other things, if you're reaming, if you're sawing, if you're cutting, it's in there. So um, clean it out, I guess. That make a long story short on that. So um, this Cody, I'll let him talk. This is a job that he worked on. And you can see what's going on here with a magnet uh, from the uh, magnetic separation and that's our fill and purge card so yeah so know. one one thing that i wanted to correct you know we 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 go over and make revisions of these uh presentations and, and look for errors and adding things here and there and one thing that was missed was our purge cart does up to 15 gallons a minute which is really nice but uh you can see here this is actually a prototype of the purge cart as it was revised um 
uh, and I was actually took it out to a job site. Now this was actually a, a fairly um, new system. There was a pretty big remodel, but there was some old sections of it as well. And so you can see there with a magnet on the lower left-hand side, how much uh, you know magnetic debris or ferrous debris that was coming out of that system. Um, but it, what I thought was so interesting about this is that even in a new system, you know, um, how much Teflon and copper shavings and, and flux came out of that system on the new side, you know, not, not just the old side. I mean, the old side was bad, but the new side was even worse uh, as far as uh, just the amount of stuff that you added to the system, not that it created on its own through, you know, oxidization and things like that. And, and I think we had another great question too in there um, that I noticed is, is, if there was any recommended times uh, or how much time would you recommend to flush a new system? And I really think that that's a, a wildly loaded question. And I'm sure you probably feel the same way, Bob. Um, it really depends on how bad the system is. And and you're only gonna know that when you start taking it apart. If you're taking it apart and it looks like mud coming out of there, well, you know you're gonna be there a while, you know, and and yeah. uh, vice versa. If, if you go to a job site and the radiant manifold uh, flow meters are all clean and clear, you, you know that's a pretty clean looking job, you know, on the inside. Uh, not necessarily on the outside, but. And I would think the manufacturer's probably right on the on the on the bottle or the jar or the drum, whatever you might be using, what size would have some uh, guidance on how long, and it probably say something, you know, new clean system so long, dirty systems get a little bit more time, but the, it's a combination of the cleaners and also, like you say, getting a good flush to make sure that you got the cleaner out before you leave too. You have to flush it. I mean, even a little residential system, I've got a, you know, systems that you have to flush them for 15 or 20 minutes before the water starts running clear and clean again. So you got to add some labor to do that on your job when you're out there doing these because it isn't something you can just do in 15 minutes and walk away from it. And Cody brought up a good point on these uh, on these carts. If you're going to build your own, for example, and you use a half horse, whatever size pump, make sure you get some large diameter hoses. I know I've for years used wash machine hoses. Most of those are going to be half, maybe five eighths. And I'll tell you, Cody learned that when we went from the five eighths to three quarter hose, I think that's where you pick up about three gallons a minute on what that pump could get out just because the hose was so restrictive. So... Yep. Uh, yeah, and we sell those as an accessory with our, our flush carts too. Our flush carts come with the two, three quarter inch hoses, but we sell them as accessories too and with the female ends on both sides and, and it makes a big difference versus those scrawny little hoses you get for the washing machines from your local home home depot or whatever you're you're working with. So Yeah, we have a company make these for us and they're nice flexible hoses. You can see there's kind of clear not exactly clear but they're braided so they're going to last so yeah if we can help you with some hoses or certainly can find those other places but if you have a, a flush cart now and you're using wash machine hoses upgrade them and you'll see a huge difference in how much water or flow you'll get through that system glycol whatever you're pumping with these things so just another tip for you there i think uh that's pretty much it there well, there's, a, I guess, an answer to one of the questions on one of the products. This is just one of the brands that I'm familiar with that I've used. They've got a couple different uh, uh, products they make. One's, like I say, a, a detergent-based, and the other one's a, more of an acid-based cleaner. But And they'll you know, answer questions if you tell them what you're up against. You can see all the different metals that this is safe, that it will work on uh, without uh, causing harm and stuff like that. But this is a sludge sometimes. This is a friend of mine that sent me this picture from a glycol system. Uh, when glycol goes bad and it starts eating away your system, you get this really, uh, gosh, it's almost like, um, I don't know how to describe it, almost like grease that comes out of your grease gun. It's just this heavy, oily sludge you get on your fingers and they're stained for a week. It's hard to get off. And that's another example why you need, number one, uh, good fluid, uh, good flush going through there, good velocity going through there. But you also need something like this to break this up so you can move it out of there because you could just blow water right through the center of this and never dislodge any of that stuff if it's just, you know, adhered to the wall of the tubing because it is an oily type of a, a residue when that glycol uh, breaks down. So... What else do we have here? So this is a company that I met years ago at one of the uh, Ixpa shows down in uh, Oklahoma. And these are guys that'll come out and do big systems for you. I don't know what size. They've got a, a, a number of different pump um, carts or <laughs> not more than a car trailer, I guess, in this case. But you can see just by the size of the hose coming off that they're going to move some pretty good uh, velocity with that size pump. And they've got these things that they can pump up to like a 12-inch diameter pipe. And what I learned from the people at that booth, which was near me in that show, he said, you got to get up to about five feet per second velocity through a pipe to start moving particles like you might see in these two uh, these two pictures over here. And he said a lot of people don't realize that with a half horsepower or a small cart, you're not 
aren't going to be able to pump that kind of fluid velocity through there. So uh, they just do the calculation. They say, well, if I've got a 10 uh, inch diameter pipe, I'll just calculate how many gallons per minute I need to put through that to be able to move five feet per second. And if you go to their website, they've actually got a really neat demo. They've got a big, Cody, you saw that, what, four inch diameter clear plastic pipe with stuff like nuts and bolts and, and crap in it. And they show pumping water through that at different uh, speeds or velocities. And he said, okay, watch when we get up to this number here. And you can see those nuts and bolts and stuff just start coming up out of the top of that pipe. So yeah, you get enough velocity and you'll start, uh, you'll start flushing cell phones and wrenches and stuff out of pipes that have been in there for years. So that's where it pays sometimes if you're up against a large system. The, you might have to call it a pro or somebody has got enough horsepower to be able to blow that out. And I think it's a good time too to bring up the fact that, you know, if, if your circulators are sized appropriately in most of your hydronic systems, they're not going to produce the velocity you need to really get stuff loose and move it around. Um, I mean, most of the time in your smaller piping systems, you're looking at two to four feet per second velocities um, to, you know, to get the heat around the building and not be too noisy. Um, if you start getting over four or five, uh, it's going to start getting noisy. You're going to start running into erosion corrosion issues if it's running like that continuously for a long time. Uh, but it's something that you need. In in order to get that stuff moving so don't don't just rely on your your three-speed pump and just cranking it to high because you know it's, it's not going to be enough in most cases yeah thanks and this one's here a pretty recent uh, slide that somebody i saw on one of the uh, social media sites and mike gave me permission to use in fact if you have a slide that you can send to us on a job or something like that uh, i'll reward you i'll send you a little uh, gift from cleffy and i sent mike uh, uh, some swag for allowing me to use his pictures here again not slamming a brand here but that's an air purger that's plugged up like that and that's probably not getting a lot of flow through it and that's a case where it'd probably take a lot of chemical to clean something that bad out at some point you might disassemble that and start over if it's plugged up that badly or get a pressure washer or something like that and and blast that out but these these aren't uncommon pictures i see these pictures uh, a lot on jobs uh, that people go to and they're having problems with a lack of heat or or pumps failing or boilers going in lockout whatever it might be so for years this has been our go go-to product for those applications that I've been showing you as a Y strainer. Yeah, good news and bad news about these. They do a good job. Uh, what you'll notice about a Y strainer, if you were to put a pressure gauge on both sides of that from the day you put it in, you're going to start to see the pressure increase on this side. And the more this device plugs up, the higher the pressure drop through it, the higher the pressure is uh, uh, going up on this side of it. And that's what would be an indication of time to flush that, just like a swimming pool filter. When the pressure on the gauge goes up, you got to backwash it. So um, we think there's a better way of getting dirt out of systems. And we think the dirt separator um, is going to do a better job for a number of reasons. Number one, we don't uh, collect the stuff right in the strain or in the fluid path. We separate it and allow it to uh, fall to the bottom of the device. So we don't see this pressure drop going through the device. And we've got a bigger capacity. You know, the, the body or the barrel, the, the separators are much bigger than what you'd see in a strainer. So a little bit more capacity in there. So you can see the pressure drop curve here of a, um, a one inch wide strainer, <clears throat> brand new out of the box. And as it gets plugged up, like maybe that strainer there is about 75% plugged up. Look at the pressure drop on that right there. So if you've got a pump that's only developing five or six pounds of pressure differential, guess what? You got zero flow going through that device when it's plugged up like uh, that previous picture, perhaps. Oh, am I looking for time here? I think we're doing pretty good. Yeah, doing good. Yeah, so that's an example of a dirt separator that we make. Uh, that happens to be a magnetic uh, separator there. So you can see what happens here is this is called a, a coalescing media. I like to call it a collision media because that's what's happening is the dirt particles come in here. They collide with that media there, and it actually drives them down to the bottom of this chamber right here. And that's where I'm going to collect it, and then I'll go and I'll open up this valve and flush it out. In addition to that little um, picture that Cody showed a couple slides back, this magnet's going to grab any small particles that are too small uh, to be trapped by the media as it goes through there. And I'm talking about probably under a five micron, pull a hair out of your head. That's about a five micron. Particles smaller than that's hard to get out with the media, but we can certainly attract them to a magnet if they're a metal particle. So that's why we've added the, um, the magnetic component. So I can flush out the big particles. I can flush out the... Uh, uh, less than five micron particles that have stuck to the magnet, pull it off, let them drop to the bottom, flush it out. So you're going to see more and more of these out there. The pump people like to see uh, better protection on systems these days for magnetic particles. As we're going to more and more ECM circulators, we want to make sure that we don't have um, any of these particles getting stuck in our, in our wet rotor circulators. 
Yeah, so there's a clear version that I made in my shop of our um, one of our dirt separators with the magnetic function on it. So you can see, I hope you can see in this picture, a little, <clears throat> little bit of reflection from the light or the camera when I took that. But you can see uh, adhered to the magnet through the clear plastic here is all the stuff that we pulled out with that magnet. So like Cody showed you in that little jar, it can be pretty substantial on an older system that's been running for years and the particles of uh, magnetite, we'll call it, um, are just laying in the pipes and in the bottom of the boilers and stuff of that uh, system. And now we start power flushing it or we start circulating it. It wasn't until we started adding magnets to these systems that we realized how much of this black magnetite is really in the systems. And that too, when you take it out, can kind of be an oily feeling. It's it's almost like the stuff that's in an etch sketch you know, a real fine black um, particle like that. But it also has an oily feeling to it um, from being in your components like that. So um, it is a little tough to get out of a system. And up here, you can see some of the copper uh, shavings and stuff that have come out with the uh, coalescing media and have settled to the bottom of the separator there. All right. Great site. I came across this as I was doing some research about, uh, you know, oxygen and boiler water and stuff like that. If you have a chance to take that down or when you get the slides, uh, go to this website. I learned a ton there uh, on water with uh, oxygen and all the issues and cause. So, um, just some good information there if you want to drill down a little bit more on the uh, the O2 component of water. So same slide there. This is a combination separator. So what we're doing here is we're giving you good air removal with a coalescing media at the top half. The bottom half is going to be a dirt separator. And then this ring is the magnetic uh, function of that. So that's actually a three-in-one device that's going to give you three uh, important functions. And we make these in larger sizes. Uh, the brass, we go up to a two-inch Cody on the brass, and then it goes to a uh, a welded steel vessel. Yeah, and I think it's a great time to bring up too. We we had a good question from Jonathan uh, about the best place to locate a dirt separator. And and in my opinion, and your 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 opinion may vary, Bob, but my my opinion, the best place to locate a dirt separator is on a common return before all the expensive stuff, before your boiler, your circulators, your everything else, because you want all that that common return to come back and all go through that dirt separator before again before it hits all the expensive stuff that uh, that they're going to reject warranty on. Uh, you want to make sure to catch it all before it gets there. Yeah, keep it out of the, your boilers and all your pumps and all your section. Now, you know, every job is going to be a little bit different. You might not have a, a, a path in your piping that would allow you to get it on one place. You know, maybe you have to put one right under the boiler. We do make vertical versions for wall hung boilers that you can put it right under the boiler. So at least you're protecting that. Um, you know, you just have to look at every system and see. But I would agree with that. You know, we want our air removal on the hottest point in the system, which would be on the discharge of the boiler. Uh, we want it on the return on a, a chiller because the temperature coming back to the chiller is going to be a little bit warmer than going out. So, but the dirt removal, you're just going to have to find the best spot in the system. Uh, and that is, to be honest with you, that is a compromise with one of these. You say, well, wait a second, I want to do my air removal at the hot point of the system. I want to do my particle removal on the return to the system. That might not be the same spot. So, yeah, you're going to have to decide, you know, which is the um, your better win there. If you've got a, a problem with air removal, I would certainly put this up at the best spot, the hottest spot in the system. Uh, you'll get a secondary uh, benefit of the dirt removal on it. But, um, you know, that's the thing when you use, when you try and put all your eggs in one basket, there's going to be some comp compromises there on the best location for a combination device so yep and like bill like bill mentions here you can you can always separate them you know have a yeah. you know an air separator on your supply and a, a dirt separator on your return so yeah here you go there's an example of a this is a Again, when we go over two-inch pipe size, we go to a well to steel vessel. So what we do on these to put a magnetic function, there's actually a dry well, a brass dry well that goes up inside here, and then you can unscrew this magnet and pull it out. So that's how we can do magnetic separation on a steel vessel. So uh, as you can see, we go pretty large on these, and we might put uh, multiple magnets in it, depending on the size of it, floor mounted. These are segmented magnets, so if you do have this close to the floor on a return pipe to a boiler, as you pull that rod out, the rod kind of breaks apart so you can get the get it out if it's mounted close to the floor. Obviously, when you have room that you can blow it down on that valve, but sometimes these get mounted uh, pretty low in the system. So that's why we, we made a, a segmented magnet rod for that. Uh, there's a little one I just talked about. This could be put right under a little wall hung boiler. You can see it's an inline like that. It is 100% of the fluid. It's not a side stream. 100% of the fluid is going to go through this device and back out. There are some <clears throat> what are called side stream filters where a portion of the water goes straight through and only a portion goes through the uh, filtration device. This is 100% um, does go through it. And as you can see, you can loosen this collar right here and you can turn it. So this could be put in a horizontal piping this way by just turning the 90 degrees 
or it can be used in a vertical. Notice we've got a lot of different uh, fitting configurations for that. If you like the press, if you like the sweat, uh, we've got PEX connections that we can put on there if you want to put in a, a PEX line for some reason. Uh, we've got a lot of different options for you. Yeah, press by far is, uh, is we've seen over the last, what, three or four years, the press has really taken over of all the fitting options that we offer now. This has really taken off the press fitting. There's a lot of different uh, brands out there now. There's a lot of different adapters available. In the beginning, you couldn't get certain reducing tees or adapters and stuff like that, but uh, I think the industry is really moving over to this type of fitting. So know that we're up to uh, two inch on all of our products are available with a press fitting. We'll continue to, to grow that line, hopefully on the bigger ones as we uh, I find a need to go to larger press sizes, but um, uh, let us know what you need. We're, you know, a small enough company that we can uh, quickly respond to requests if we need a new product or a new um, connection or something like that, let us know. So here's something, I got two more slides. So this is something I came up with, oh gosh, when the Munchkin boiler first came out in the whatever, the 90s, I was doing these systems like this, and I was trying to figure out a way that I could purge this entire system here from one valve. Now I do have one on the manifolds here, but I came up with this, and I won't read it all now. You can look at this later. But with this one uh, purge ball valve here, I figured out a way that I could purge the boiler, I could purge the indirect tank, I could purge the uh, secondary loop here, I could purge everything by just changing uh, which valves were open and closed on this, isolating the uh, isolation valves here, opening this, go through the heat exchanger. So instead of putting the valve out here, a valve on the boiler, a valve on the system down here, uh, I used it. And now you could do even better with that new valve that you can purge from either direction. Uh, when I did this little graphic, it could only purge from one direction, being able to purge from two directions. You could, if you thought about it, put one major um, purge valve that you could do everything in that piping system from one point. So that would just kind of save you some cost on putting valves uh, scattered throughout the, um, the piping system there. So did those, did those valves help you when you had to change out those poor munchkins too? <laughs> well, maybe have one <laughs> on both sides, but you know, yeah. knock on, I've had pretty good luck with that little coil heat exchanger. I think most of the, the learning curve was on those first years, you yeah, know, for sure. years in the back, but the, uh, uh, water quality had a lot to do with it, but yeah, there's certainly some 20-year-old munchkins probably still uh, purring away out there. I can't count how many times I saw those things straight piped with no primary, secondary, or hydraulic separation, and it was just a, they were fighting a losing battle from the word go, so... Yeah. So interesting about this, and again, I didn't put that BNG, um, I can just read right off it here, I'm kind of a an analog man in a digital world here, so I've got a cheap, cheap notes, but right off of this uh, BNG, they said, um, uh, the water has to be between uh, uh, seven and nine grains per gallon. And I'm looking at this thing here where Denver's looking at boosting, the, putting inhibitors in their water to protect some of that lead pipe leach and they're getting up into this nine range. So they're actually making water that uh, could be out of the range on what the pump manufacturers alone in their pumps. So the other thing, this one down here is actually from one of the stainless steel indirect tanks, the water quality spec here. Uh, so if you look at their hardness there, remember I said 80, 85% of the U.S. has water over seven grains per gallon hardness. So you pretty much void the warranty of this device right here if you're putting it into a job where you've got typical water in the U.S. of A. that's over seven grains hard. Uh, other critical numbers in here, the um, the TDS number. Uh, let's see what a B and G have on there. As I said, over 100 parts per million on the TDS number uh, is excessive, and they don't like that. And then they had the um, I don't know if they, I don't think they had chlorides on theirs, but this one here is, is critical on stainless steel and aluminum boilers, this chloride level, 150 uh, parts per million or less. What you're going to find with this water um, as we go around, we've seen some water over 300 parts per million in different places of the U.S. And if you're in an area where they put a lot of anti-icers and de-icers on the roads, uh, calcium chloride, magnesium chloride, sodium chloride are, are what they're using for de-icers and anti-icers now. Obviously, that gets into our aquifers, gets into our wells. So that's why we're seeing this numbers coming up and up and up over the years in uh, certainly snowbell con uh, countries uh, or places. Uh, and that's a number that you might want to get a meter to read that if you're using a lot of stainless steel boilers or stainless steel indirect tanks. And if you do have it over that number there, now you got to figure out how to fix your water before you put it in there. You're going to have to uh, put that through a treatment process that you can pull that. Um, and you'll see that show up as a TDS number. It won't tell you specifically what it is. You'll need more of a meter to read chloride specifics, but that number, uh, I think we're going to see going up and up as the, as the years go by just from the 
everything that's getting into our aquifer. You know, a lot of that too, uh, the trucking industry is suffering from chlorides, the, uh, the fog that you see at night and the headlights when you're driving down the road after it dries, after they put the de-icers on the road, you know, you feel it in your throat, your eyes start to water. That's the chlorides that are airbound. So now they're going into the trucks, they're getting in the electronics and stuff like that, but they're getting in our rivers and our wells. Uh, the bridge failure up in Minnesota on I-35 years ago was related to the, um, the cars that got in there and got to the rebar, got to the fasteners on that bridge. And uh, that's why you see so many bridges as you drive around the U.S. are getting inspected and upgraded. They found that all those uh, chlorides are leaching in, getting to that rebar and all the fasteners in those uh, overpasses and underpasses, and that's causing the problem. But for us, uh, we don't want it in our piping systems. We certainly don't want it in our boilers and in our uh, heat exchange and stuff like that, because anything in here that's out of spec, that manufacturer could refuse a warranty on this tank, or if this was a boiler maybe um, that was made out of stainless steel, this is, um, it's telling you if your water is not within that spec, it's not our fault if you bring it back and you've got a pinhole and the welds failed on it because it's been attacked by um, aggressive water. <clears throat> Huh. How'd I do? Pretty good for timing, I think. Perfect timing, I'd say, Bob. Yeah. Um, I did notice a couple of quick questions, and maybe Max, maybe you've got some more as well, but uh, there's quite a number of questions about the use of inhibitors or products after the final yeah. fill. Uh, what are your thoughts on that, Bob? Yeah, I mean, again, it's... Um, so here's what we're learning as, as we start doing this uh, this committee that we got uh, going with IAPMA about water quality, what uh, one of our first assignments was bring as much information as you found out there on what's going on in the world. And one of the fellows brought a, got permission to use the VDI standard out of Germany. And they said, you got two choices with your fill water. Either fix your water before you put it into the system, filter it and treat it, whatever it takes. Or once you put water in your system, that's out of the spec I just showed you on that previous slide, then you have to start putting chemicals that can uh, that can lock up that hardness, that can keep those minerals in suspension so they're not going to coat out. So um, and it's kind of a little bit of a a debate within our within our committee right there they said well you know we sell conditioner chemicals that we think that's the best answer and then other people are saying well we sell water filtration equipment but we think you should fix the water so i don't know where we're going to end up with that certainly there's no harm in fixing your water before you put it in there i'm of the opinion it's good to put a chemical in there after you fix the water uh, because you're going to get oxygen scavengers you're going to get ph buffers you're going to get film providers you're going to get lubrication for the uh, the bearings and stuff in your wet rotor pumps so I think there's a good place for the, um, you know, the hydronic conditioner chemicals after you put the good water in the system, after you flush and clean it. That's my opinion. You know, that that changes with different people depending on what side of the fence you're on. If you're the the water quality people, if you're the uh, chemical sales people, certainly <laughs> want to uh, promote that. But I see I see a place for both. I'm in the middle there. I can see where. You know, there's a, a a place for chemicals, both on old bad systems, but also new systems that you don't want to put aggressive water in and uh, have problems with your uh, your deionized or demineralized water, which will be a low pH. Anytime you purify water by whatever means, whether it's reverse osmosis, a deionizer, demineralizer, distilling the water, and anybody does that, you're going to make even softening water. You're going to make that water aggressive. You're going to drop it into the sixes. I think six point mid sixes for softened water typically. Again, it varies to depend on the equipment. That's a little aggressive to the metals in your system. So if you put that in there, one of two things is going to happen. That aggressive water is going to pull. It's going to pull some of your brass apart, some of your copper, some whatever metals are in your system. It's going to pull and it's going to buffer itself up. And we tried that on a couple jobs, Cody and I both, that the water we left the uh, in the system in the mid sixes and you come back a week later and it's buffed up into the sevens to a pretty neutral thing. If that does concern you, you could put a chemical in immediately and buffer that back up. Most of the time when you put a conditioner chemical in, you're going to buffer it up much higher because the chemical that you put in there is going to raise the pH maybe up into eight or nines, but it's raising the pH with good things not scaling minerals that you just took out of there with the softener or whatever you treat it with, but it's put in chemicals that are giving you film providers, that are giving you scavengers for the oxygen, that are giving you a pH buffer. So if you measure the pH of a system that has a chemical in it, you better get the test kit from that chemical company so that you're, you're measuring, knowing that there's good things in that water. You don't want to flush out somebody that just put hundreds of dollars of conditioner in there. You come with your TDS meter and say, whoa, it's off the scale and you flush it out, but you just flushed out uh, gold basically when you flush out those hundred dollar gallon chemicals maybe. So um, <clears throat> yeah, that's kind of, you know, we'll we'll learn more about that if we do get a standard developed. When we get a standard developed, we should have some pretty good guidelines as far as um, your options. I don't think it's going to be this is the only way to do it. Here's your options, just like um, 
like we feel the VDI standard does a pretty good job of addressing your options for um, um, water and closed loop systems, basically. Yeah, and I, I think, you know, to a, a great sum of all these points is the fact that there's not a, sil a single silver bullet, you know, to take care of these systems. I mean, you know, you there there's all these pieces of the puzzle that you have to put together to create the solution you need. So uh, we get a lot of guys that say, I've got a really dirty system. I want to put in a dirt mag. And I say, that's fantastic. I will sell you as many dirt mags as you want, uh, mm -hmm. magnetic dirt separators. But the issue is, is that, you know, these separators can only take out what comes to them. So, I mean, you got to think about purging it out. Well, if, if the stuff is really stuck in there good, then maybe you might need a cleaner to loosen it up first and things like that. Um, and, and so, I mean, you can't just look at it as one single solution. You got to look at it as, you know, multiple pieces uh, of a solution that you have to put together based on the job. And, and there's, like I said, not just one sing, single silver bullet, that's for sure. And you might have to go back there multiple times. We had that video, Cody, yeah. somebody sent us from, what was it, Wisconsin or something like that? Hit a, a oh, dirt yeah. step, a separate. He went back for a couple of years and, you know, got a lot out the first time. And every time he went back, he got less and less till it came out pretty clear. But, yeah, it took a while. It was a big system, a big commercial yeah. system with miles of pipe. But, you know, don't expect it to just all happen on the first visit on a dirty old system especially. But yeah. what else you got, Max? Anything uh, come across that was interesting you could share with the group? So I just put into the chat and sent it to everybody as well. There was a coffee with Kalefi um, that John Siegenthaler did uh, that was water quality and hydronic systems. That was a full hour on this too that really I think would address some of these um, more uh, complex questions that we're getting at the end of the webinar. Uh, so that's a great resource. Um, yeah, because some of these really get into uh, chemical uh, company questions uh, kind of fast or different uh, component manufacturers and things like that. Okay. But I think you've yeah, covered the, the high level pieces here. Yeah, and also we had, um, what was the name? Uh, can't remember the fellow name now from uh, Dow Chemical came and did a uh, presentation for us years ago. And so what'll happen is when we digitize that issue number, what's our water quality one, Cody number? 18. 18. 18. When we do put a digital version of that, we'll have on the side column the links to different webinars that went along with that because Siggy did a water quality. We had uh, uh, Jeff Persons from uh, Geo Exchange in Ohio did a water quality for us over the years. Uh, uh, we also had, uh, I think it was a Drew did one years ago from Noble uh, Glycol, and then the fellow from um, Dow Chemical did one specific to glycols on the system for us too. So we've had, we've got at least four different uh, um, water or glycol quality webinars that we've done over the years, and they are on our on our website. They're um, on our YouTube channel. Though, if it was a webinar, it'll be on our YouTube channel and be uh, archived there. But we'll try and get those on with the um, that uh, web address I showed you a little bit earlier. It takes you right to the hydronics page, and that will show you the um, uh, the webinars that went along with that hydronics issue. So thanks for bringing that up, Max. Yeah, and any questions that we didn't get answered during the presentation, uh, Cody and I and Max, whoever, will answer every question that came in. We'll we'll send you an email uh, response. So it might take us a couple of days to to get to all of them if there was a lot of them came in. But uh, what? Yeah, we'll get to you. unless your email address or something doesn't go through. If you don't get something from us within a couple of days or a week, send it to us again because sometimes I've tried to email back to people and it, it bounces back for some reason. It could be uh, could be operator error too, but I usually just copy uh, copy and paste uh, from the Excel sheet that Mary sends me and try to copy your question, copy your email address and paste it and then uh, send a response is, is kind of my the method to my madness. So, all right. Um. But Perfect, yes. Bob. Yeah, I think that was a good one. And uh, yeah, and if there's any other questions, I mean, you see the tech support team right there. Uh, myself, Greg, uh, Dan, Kevin, Bob, Max, any you contact any one of us if you have any questions on, on hydronics in general, product specific, doesn't matter. We're here to help you guys out. Yeah. And... Uh, <laughs> Well, I think you yeah, got one more. Don't forget to connect with us on social media. You know, Bob uh, Bob actually mentioned the idea that we like a lot of pictures. We love pictures, okay? Absolutely love pictures. They're worth a million words, not just a thousand. And uh, so connect with us on social media, share those photos. We love to see them. Uh, we also love to get your permission to use them in webinars too. So that's pretty fantastic as well. And, uh, and I think that's just about it. Yeah, perfect. That's the last one. Thanks, everybody, for uh, joining us today, hanging in today. Let us know how we can help you. Keep sending, like Cody said, pictures and uh, information that we can all learn and uh, grow from. And uh, have a happy Thanksgiving, a safe Thanksgiving, and we'll see you again in uh, about a month, I guess. Anything Perfect. else?
No, I think we're good, Bob. Have a great day, guys. Thanks, everybody.